So this is panel number two on platform liability, one that is provoking a lot of discussion online, on Twitter. And of course, you can still keep sending in your questions using the hashtag FixCopyright. We have, as before, the same format, three academics and one representative of the EU institutions. So we have Dr. Sophie Stala bourdillon from the University of Southampton. We have Tito Rendas from the Universidade Católica Portuguesa. We have Dr. Giuseppe Maziotti from Trinity College Dublin. And we will be getting reaction and questions from uh, Axel Voss here from the European Parliament. So, Sophie, I'm going to kick off with you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for uh, organizing the event. Uh, that's, uh, and, and I'm very happy to, to see the, the room uh, full of people today. The question that I'm going to uh, try to answer in my five minutes uh, is uh, whether filtering obligations and fundamental rights are friends or foes. Uh, in a more prosaic way, uh, is, is whether can the European Union eat the cake of fundamental rights or have it too? So let's start with filtering obligations or mandatory upload filters or mandatory content recognition technologies. So lots of fancy names here. Why this amalgamation? Because the use of content recognition technologies is presented as a measure to prevent the availability of copyright works in Article 13. A bit of math. So if I take Article 13 and I uh, add it to Recital 38, I get an obligation to put in place upload filters for online platforms. And this is particularly true if you read the last sentence of Recital 38. Why upload filters? Can we have upload filters? Well, some might say we have some already. Audible Magic, Google, but Google should only count for one. Facebook. Few platforms have expensive upload filters. Upload filters are like any luxury. Many talk about it, but only uh, a few can afford it. The real question is, should we have mandatory upload filters so that many end up having upload filters? To answer that question, we need to look at the legal framework uh, to work with it. So therefore, we're asking the question, what are the limits set by EU law? We find Article 15 of the e-commerce directive, which uh, contains a prohibition of general monitoring obligations. But that does not stop here. What are the limits set by fundamental rights, which are part of the EU acquis, of course? The answer to the question is actually uh, to be found in the decision of the Court of Justice uh, in Saban versus Netlog. Sabam, in that very case, uh, requested Netlog, a social media platform, to uh, immediately seize the making available of musical or audiovisual works. How could Netlog, the social media uh, network, do it in practice? With content recognition technologies, of course. In other words, by implementing upload filters. What did the Court of Justice say in that case? Such an order is not compatible with EU law. Why? There are different reasons uh, for that uh, holding. The first one is that such a mandatory filtering system would oblige the provider to actively monitor almost all the data relating to all of its service users in order to prevent future infringement. And that would be a violation of my Article 15 of the e-commerce directive. Second reason, because the Court of Justice does not stop at Article 15. Such a mandatory filtering system will involve the systematic analysis of user information. And that creates a problem with my right to data protection. So there is a very intimate relationship between Article 15 and the right to data protection. 
Third, such a mandatory filtering system could lead to the blocking of lawful communications. And this is where I have a problem with freedom of expression, therefore. So I also have an intimate relationship between Article 15, in that very case, and freedom of expression information. Why that in particular? Because there is no full harmonization of exceptions at the EU level. So it's actually very difficult uh, to make decisions as to whether which exception apply in which case. And above all, contact recognition technology is not able to assess context. So this is where my trap is. Four, such a mandatory filtering system would involve an unlimited monitoring of most stored information in order to prevent future infringement. And here, I have a serious interference with the right to conduct one's business. So another intimate relationship between Article 15 and the freedom to conduct one's business. Maybe too many affairs, but certainly not if one is serious about fundamental rights. So just to be clear, uh, the main message I would like to convey in my, in, in my five minutes is that the old-fashioned e-commerce directive is not the only reason why mandatory upload filters are problematic. Or better, the e-commerce directive is rooted into fundamental right protection. And one needs to take that into account before trying to impose uh, filters on most of the online platforms uh, through the means of Article 13 of the e-commerce directive. Thank you. The rest is in the written contribution. OK. We will turn now then straight away to Tito, please. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for putting together such a timely event. Um, I think, like the vast majority of commentators, that the value gap proposal suffers from a number of fundamental problems. The main substantive problems, I think, uh, are those that Sophie just described. The proposal basically uh, restricts fundamental rights in a disproportionate way, and it also hinders uh, digital innovation. I entirely agree with what Sophie said, so I will skip those and move to a different topic. I will focus instead on the rationale behind this proposal and on its formal problems. So over the last few years, right holders and their representatives have been floating the idea that there is a value gap that needs to be closed. Basically, what they say is that uh, platforms of user-uploaded content like YouTube or Dailymotion, we know who they are, have become important vehicles for online distribution of works. Because these platforms are covered by the hosting safe harbor of the e-commerce directive, um, right holders claim that they are not always able to obtain fair remuneration uh, from these platforms. And they add that the unfairness is made evident by the difference between the remuneration that they voluntarily obtain from these platforms that are generally ad-funded, uh, and the remuneration paid, on the other hand, by subscription services such as Spotify Premium or Deezer. Some scholars have argued that uh, this value gap rhetoric is fabricated by right holders. I would not be so hard on right holders and on the commission, but I think it's at least fair to say that the justification for this proposal is question begging. Right holders explain very clearly that there is a revenue gap, but I think that they fail to explain why that gap should be closed. The idea of a value gap appeals to the intuition. You, you demonstrate that there is a gap, you say, this is unfair, let's close the gap, and I've been to conferences where the audience starts nodding in agreement. Um, but there's a step that is missing, I think. It does not follow from the fact that there is a gap that that gap should be closed. Even if there is a difference in revenue, there may be a very good justification for that difference. Platforms like YouTube rely on their basis on user-generated content and operate on the basis of fundamentally different purposes and business models than services like Spotify, which rely entirely on content that needs to be licensed. Um, right holders fail to explain why platforms of user-generated content should close the value gap. They take the proposition for granted. In other words, they beg the question. And to beg the question is an example of an informal fallacy. And at this time, or ever, uh, I don't think that the EU can afford to pass legislation that is based on fallacious reasoning. Uh, moving to the formal problems, I will not be as mild here. I'm afraid there is no 
um, soft way of saying this. From the formal point of view, the value gap proposal is an exemplar of poor legal drafting. And it suffers from three fundamental problems. And I will proceed by ascending order of importance. Um, if I exceed the time limit, just, just interrupt me, please. Uh, problem number one, the proposal includes normative provisions in the recitals. It makes two significant changes to the acquis in recital 38. This recital states that platforms of user uploaded content perform an act of communication to the public. So basically it says that all platforms, not just platforms like the Pirate Bay, like the CJU said, which might be considered reasonable, all platforms in providing access to works will be liable for communicating works to, to the public, at least prima facie. That means at least before a defense uh, applies. This is not merely a codification of CJU case law. It goes well beyond CJU case law. The second uh, problem, or the second change, I mean, is that Recital 38 also purports to codify CJU case law on the hosting safe harbor, but it omits an important reference to knowledge and control that lies in CJU case law. As we all know, recitals are not supposed to contain uh, normative provisions. There's an interinstitutional agreement that mentions this. The CGU case law mentions this. And this is so for very good reasons, for reasons related to legal certainty and to the protection of expectations of legal subjects. And I think that the draft directive grossly neglects uh, these values in this proposal. Problem number two, the proposal uses trivially vague language. The paradigmatic example of a vague word is the word bold. Vague words have borderline cases. We all know people that are bold, we all know people that are clearly not bold, and we know people that are borderline bold. I would count myself as a borderline bold person. Um, so lawmakers tend to avoid employing these trivially vague terms. For instance, if lawmakers want to tax rich people more heavily, they will not enact a norm imposing a higher rate on rich people. They will do so by reference to a precise level of income. Now, Article 13 applies to platforms that store and provide access to large amounts of content uploaded by their users. And I'm afraid the, the proposal by Estonia doesn't make things much better because it replaces large with significant, which it suffers exactly from the same problem. So large and significant, like the word bold, are trivially, are trivially vague words that the law should um, avoid. It is beyond doubt that YouTube and Dailymotion are platforms hosting large amounts of user uploaded content. But what about, for instance, the Portuguese platform Sapo Videos? Is it large? Is it non-large? Where and how should the line be uh, drawn? Um, the third, okay, the third problem and the most serious one is that the proposal lacks basic clarity. Article 13, number one, read together with recital 38, is a remarkably confusing provision. There are multiple, multiple examples of lack of clarity. I'll focus very briefly on two. Recital 38 says that platforms that are eligible for the safe harbor um, must take measures to ensure the functioning of licensing agreements. But right before that statement, the recital said that they did not need to conclude those agreements. So it's at best puzzling to say that they need to ensure the functioning of agreements that they don't need to conclude, right? Um, Article 13, this is the second example, imposes two alternative obligations upon platforms, but it seems that these obligations, when Article 13, number one, is read together with recital 38, uh, are in reality only one and the same obligation and a very worrying one, which is that online platforms implement content recognition technologies. I will conclude. Uh, I know that these problems are probably the result of a very long, a very difficult, and a compromise-ridden uh, drafting process. But I think at this stage, it should be kept in mind that the proposed formulation will result in diverging transpositions by member states, resulting in disharmony, resulting in legal uncertainty, which is exactly what a digital single market does not need. Thank you. OK, so I think what we need is compromise then. Good luck with that. So, Giuseppe. Let me start by thanking the organizers of this uh, uh, conference, in particular, Julia Reda, the, the whole uh, Greens group, uh, also for you know, uh, giving us a uh, uh, reason to be active in August, especially in Southern Europe. <laughs> I was uh, drafting this uh, contribution that you uh, can read together with the other uh, contributions. 
um, from the title, you can actually uh, understand that my position with regard to Article 13 is quite different from the position of my colleagues. I believe that a problem exists. The Commission acted uh, in a way that I don't feel very critical about when it comes to the language. The language can be improved. We are in the Parliament. The Parliament has the institutional responsibility also to fix flaws that exist in the proposal, also to find a more balanced uh, position. But in my view, it's undeniable that a problem of coordination between the uh, e-commerce directive and the uh, Information Society Directive on Copyright Protection exists. I emphasize this also in a study that I authored together with colleagues at the Center for European Policy Studies on, the, on how the Information Society Directive from 2001 was implemented. There is a basic problem of coordination. And there is also an issue with concern, um, sorry, an issue with concern um, the technology we have at our disposal today. Uh, none of the pieces of legislation we are talking about had the web, so-called Web 2.0 in mind, the interactive uh, internet in mind. So when we talk about whether or not the platform should enjoy the uh, liability exemption provided by the e-commerce directive, we should consider that the, the exemption granted to hosting providers was referred to activities that do not look like the activities that these platforms perform today. And this is, in my view, let me add, uh, act today as an advocate of the Commission in this respect. The Commission um, is pretty clear in its impact assessment in this respect and uh, in saying that at the end of the day, uh, a problem uh, exists and must be fixed. What I'm very skeptical about is, about, uh, is the novelty of this obligation to filter. For me, this is an attempt by the European Commission to fix a problem that deals with basic copyright law. In so far as uh, online platforms are aware of what goes on uh, on their own networks, they have a legal obligation to remove what is not authorized by the copyright holders. So the real problem that this provision seeks to address uh, is uh, the um, um, unclear and not very reliable way uh, with which the courts of the member states have interpreted this liability exemption in the e-commerce directive. The idea, and this is a way to fix the problem, is to limit, to avoid that national courts can interpret this exemption in an inaccessibly broad way. So I don't see this as a new obligation. Filtering uh, is something that should already be done. Uh, and uh, an evidence of that is given by the fact that the, the most advanced platforms already do, do that, as it has been uh, emphasized a few minutes ago. Google is a prominent example in this respect with Content ID. Um, so I endorse, to a large extent, the uh, arguments of the Commission, especially if, you, if we read this proposal from a horizontal perspective and we look at how the Commission has acted as a proponent of new legislation in other fields. If we look, for instance, at how the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, the, 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 uh, the new directive, the, 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 the revision has been, uh, has been uh, done in a way that platforms bear more responsibilities when it comes to hate speech, when it comes to certain type of content. It's not censorship, it's just regulation, right? So to a certain extent, uh, these platforms are direct competitors of, to a certain extent, even though the structure of the service is different, of uh, providers of on-demand uh, uh, service providers. So there, there is no point in uh, creating different conditions for business and discriminating between uh, services that at the end of the day provide us with access to very similar content. So a particular perspective that I would like to touch upon with you, and I would be happy to discuss with you in the uh, question and answers session, is the perspective of uh, weaker copyright holders. By weaker copyright holders, I mean individual creators and small or medium-sized content producers that so far have not been able to rely very much on the notice and takedown mechanism that you are very much familiar with. The idea of you know, monitoring what goes on on platforms and then asking the platform devices to take the content down. 
they are in an awkward position that I define as a lose-lose situation if you read my paper. Why? Because on one hand, unlike the majors that have you know, well-funded and efficient uh, uh, entities that deal with enforcement and with notices, they cannot easily enforce rights. They depend on whether or not the platform is well-equipped with technology as Google, for instance, is with content ID. On the other hand, if you join, try to think of yourself becoming a creator and hoping that you might become a professional creator. If you join one of the, the, these platforms, you are obliged to give these platforms a free global and perpetual license. So you don't even have the possibility of monetize easily what you uh, write. So just to put my presentation to an end, and then I'll be happy to discuss the details uh, later on, um, what we should do, in, in my view, at this stage, is to think of the Article 13 uh, provision in relation to the broad objectives of the directive, the most important of which from this perspective, from a remuneration perspective, is to empower authors and empower uh, creators more generally. So we already have Article 14 and 15 that should be read in conjunction with Article, 50, uh, Article 13. So if uh, Article 13 is expected to bring more money to the creative sector, this money should be given in part, in a significant part, to the creators. So if we made it sure that the right to information provided under Article um, uh, 14 and 15 and also the, the right to obtain a not disproportionately low remuneration because of the exploitation which is done on these platforms, I believe this very controversial, very much criticized provision had a much stronger justification. Thanks. Thank you. And finally, Axel, your responses and questions, I hope, to our academics. So hello to everyone, and thanks uh, also from my side for the invitation. And um, so we should at least absolutely be aware um, that intermediaries often make profit uh, with content that they do not create. And uh, these profits are not always shared fairly with the concerned uh, creators, if so, um, if to say nearly never. And we should therefore be open for a reassessment of the liability of service providers um, with regards to copyright infringements. Regarding the relationships um, between platforms and right holders, we should therefore acknowledge also the existing value gap. Um, this is why uh, providers that store or provide uh, the public with um, access to large amounts of copyright protected works uploaded by their users um, should be obliged to conclude licensing agreements with right holders. To define which platforms are concerned and which are not, we should probably or, or definitely discuss at least um, a definition of, of communication to the public. And I think um, criteria like selecting or categorizing could be part of the definition. Of course, we must also think about those cases um, where no licenses uh, are concluded. In this case, I could imagine um, that at least the big players shall ensure that no copyrighted works are available on their platform. And this shall not lead to a general control, but should be effective enough to prevent copyright infringement, infringements, respecting, of course, all fundamental rights, especially the freedom of expression and, and freedom of information, but having also in mind that a property right is also a kind of a fundamental right. Um, therefore, we have to balance all these um, in, in the new era of technology, of digitalization, et cetera. In this context, also we should also discuss the role of the copyright holders, and I think they will have to ensure that the platforms do have all relevant input to prevent copyright infringements. 
So, of course, um, there might be the questions of costs and what about uh, smaller companies and startups. And this, um, I would say, as a lawyer, this can be regulated somehow. So that's not a reason for me in saying, oh, we shouldn't uh, close the value gap and we shouldn't use this one. But um, at the end, I think if we are creative enough, then probably we can think about some of these um, levels or, or balance situation. And concerning the liability rules of the e-commerce uh, directive, uh, these providers, from my point of view, shall not benefit from the liability exemption um, since uh, that applies only to totally neutral and passive online service providers. So we must ensure that the content which is created in Europe does not only bring profits mm -hmm. to platforms out of Europe. And there we should also be a little bit more self-confident. Um, Europe creates a lot of content, mm -hmm. but the aggregated value added is not taking place in Europe also. And if the figure is right, um, so Europe is creating 70% of the content, I was told, and I think this uh, figure is okay. But again, this is not only about um, the right itself, it's also a kind of uh, economic um, situation that we have to have in mind. And um, therefore, um, I would say we have to close this value gap and we should think about how we can do this in a proper way. Okay, thank you. Well, since the question has been raised, I'm going to take the temperature of the room and ask for a show of hands. Who thinks the value gap exists? Okay, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> um, and perhaps then, would you like to comment on whether that sort of reflects what you think? Well, um, you'd probably need a bigger sample to make a reliable statistical claim, but still, um, I have seen, to complete my reasoning, I was afraid that, uh, that I would run out of time, I have seen attempts at uh, justifying why we should close the value gap. One of those attempts was by the IFPI, who sent a letter to, um, to President Juncker saying that the value gap threatens the survival of the next generation of creators. Now, uh, I think that this argument was much more persuasive back in the piracy days in which the revenue was dramatically falling. But the IFPI itself has published a report showing that the pie is getting bigger, showing that there have been a consistent increases in global revenues at 5 to 6% rates, and that last year the digital revenues increased 17.7%. So I think that um, it's unpersuasive. If it's not question begging, it's unpersuasive. It's unpersuasive, and I think that's why most people don't believe that there is a value gap. Uh, I think using the, the, the expression value gap is to some extent misleading because although I can see that there is a discrepancy between the revenues of these uh, platforms and the revenues of right holders, um, up until now, it, it just stopped there. So, uh, and calling that a value gap and explaining this value gap by saying that only two categories of stakeholders are involved in the process, the platform, and the right holder is oversimplifying the, the, the value creation process. Um, so not a, and plus, there is this idea that there is a value gap, uh, although we don't have any much data on that. Uh, there is this idea that we need a remedy for that value gap, and that remedy needs to be uh, the, f the filters uh, to some extent. So uh, I'd like more data and, and, and conceptual and, and more explanation as to what exactly is the value gap, what is it that we are measuring, and second, I'd like to have more thought of how, if there is any gap between these two categories of stakeholders, how we can remedy that gap. Uh, and instead of, of jumping and go for filters, uh, maybe, yeah, we can be creative, uh, but we need more brainstorming. 
Well, um, I think it, the, the abuse of the expression value gap doesn't help our debate in the sense that we actually don't know if a value gap exists. It has to be clarified whether we entail that some money has been taken by the intermediary or some or the same money or more money has been just lost by by someone because at the end of the day if you if you, if you put yourself in the shoes of a individual creator or a poorly equipped or not particularly resourceful uh, uh, content producer you would immediately realize that the problem exists the problem that the commission is trying to fix is whether or not the property rule behind copyright should survive or not because that's a problem Many technology companies complain about the fact that this provision might actually be in breach of the um, of Article 15 of the e-commerce directive. The, the member states should not end up imposing monitoring obligations, right? But why should creators do this? <laughs> why should the monitoring duty in terms of survival uh, in terms of business survival should be placed on creators. And second of all, um, well, we are not naive, right? We know that these platforms, businesses, be, uh, rely on user profiling and gathering of data. We are all observed when we upload and watch things on YouTube or on Facebook, right? So I don't understand why these platforms should, on one hand, uh, have the right, perfectly fine, eh, under, uh, under privacy law as well, to follow us, to monitor us, to know all what we do, on the other hand, not compensating the creators. Because, and let me finish uh, on this point, if, uh, one more minute maybe. I think we have also abused of the expression user-generated content. Because if I take a film produced by someone I don't even know and I place it online at the disposal of all of you, that's not user-generated content. That's a piece of content that I took from someone else. And believe me, you will never understand the problem until when you'll put yourself in the shoes of the creator uh, himself or herself. This is something that I've seen as a consultant, as a lawyer in the last years. These people do not believe anymore in copyright in, uh, uh, on the internet. And this is something that we should fix. Otherwise, a digital single market will miss an, an important objective. We cannot be strong on technology with, uh, without being strong on content at the same time. This is my, my point. OK, well, since you've touched on it, and it is sort of the elephant boom, the, I mean, the e-commerce directive does prohibit general monitoring. So the question then is whether a mandatory upload filtering constitutes general monitoring. Axel, I'm going to come to you, because I know the EPP's position says that upload filtering is fine if it's not general monitoring. So in your opinion, is it or isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I would say the filtering, if this might be a kind of a solution for avoiding infringements of copyright works, then um, it might be um, one tool but this tool has to be created in a way that we are not doing something what the um, ECJ is saying, we don't have to monitor all of these. And probably it's not necessary to do a kind of 100% job, but, um, but close to this might be helpful. But therefore there might be some, but I'm not a technician, um, but there might be some solutions in saying so it's already helpful if we have a kind of a typical signature or whatever, then if, if this pops up, then um, we, we have some shown cases of, of infringements or whatever. I don't know if, if we are more creative, probably there are other solutions, but if there is someone in the room with other solutions, please come up with it. It might be helpful in the whole discussions. Mm -hmm. And um, so, but we, we have to do something, just accepting infringements of copyrighted works. This is not the solution of everything. Tito, where do you think the line should be in terms of upload filtering? So I, um, I'm not a technical expert either. Uh, I don't know anything, uh, honestly, about filters. Uh, the descriptions I have read uh, sound reasonable to me. In order to detect infringing works, you would have to monitor all the works that are uploaded onto the platform. This sounds commonsensical to me, and I believe this. 
um, but I, I don't know more than this. But I think that um, the main problem is not with Article 15 itself, like Sophie highlighted. Uh, lawmakers may well want to amend Article 15. They may well want to uh, create an exception to Article 15. The problem is that Article 15 is, like Sophie said, deeply rooted in fundamental rights. And if enacted, we run the risk, because that's the position of the CJU in its case law, of seeing the CJU striking down uh, the law because it violates fundamental rights. As to upload filters, um, I've, I read something as to where the line should be drawn. I think that was, that was your question. Um, I read uh, something on, on Giuseppe's uh, paper uh, saying that um, if, we, if we pass this legislation, we would be stimulating the development of more effective content recognition um, technologies. Now, I have issues uh, with this argument. If somehow you could give me a content recognition technology that was affordable, that uh, did not produce false positives, or at least a de minimis number of false positives, did not involve mass processing of user data, but then again, I'm not an expert, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about this, then I would totally buy uh, the implementation of content recognition technologies. At the, state of, at the current state of technology, I don't buy this argument because I don't think you stimulate technological development by passing legislation that restricts fundamental rights. I will give you a potentially absurd example. If, if I asked you if you would pass a law that forces consumers to buy electric cars as a way to promote the development of more affordable electric cars, you would probably disagree with this claim. Uh, so that's why I think that passing this legislation in the hope that more affordable and more effective content recognition technologies are developed is not the best idea. Um, so to go back to the issue of, of general monitoring uh, and the argument that we need filters because we don't want to have copyright infringement online. Um, we already have something to deal uh, with uh, copyright infringement. We have notice and action procedures. Um, and, and to some extent, these, these mechanisms uh, rely on content recognition technology, at least at the detection phase. Uh, but what is uh, meant to be built within these things is, is, is a process so that we make sure it's not perfect and actually we don't have it at the EU level yet. So that might be one way of, of further harmonizing uh, EU law uh, in that field. The idea behind it is to involve all stakeholders and make sure the decision to do something about the content is made after everyone has been heard, in order to make sure exceptions in particular can be taken into account. So to the argument that we don't have anything and we, uh, nothing can be done, uh, we need to do more and uh, we need to uh, modify or get rid of the requirements directive in Article 15, that said, no, we have something. Uh, we could have something actually better because uh, up until now, the, 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 the harmonization of the notice and action procedure has been postponed by the European Commission. Well, on content identification technologies, there are uh, fields. The, the reason why I, I put that remark in my paper is that there are fields where these technologies work pretty well and fields where these technologies are not the music sector, for instance, mm -hmm. sound recordings. And other fields, for instance, photography, where this kind of technology are not well developed yet. But it's not only a technological issue, as we know. It's also an issue concerning the creation of databases, right? For the, in the music sector, we have a data, I mean, an ongoing database, and we, 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 uh, you certainly remember the, go, the global uh, repertoire uh, database that uh, um, didn't develop uh, until uh, uh, the end, but at the end of the day, it was a, a prominent example. So um, the reason why I believe that this technology should be developed is that uh, we should be consistent. We either keep the property rule behind copyright, or we uh, switch to a remuneration, or, you know, more flat, uh, tax idea, uh, the uh, uh, um, broad remuneration principle idea, uh, abandoning the property rule, right? Because otherwise, how could I know how much a piece of content is exploited commercially? We already know, for instance, on Spotify, how many times a certain recording is streamed, right? So this is also due to the fact that there is a database behind it that is a way to calculate that. 
so we should be consistent. I'm not saying that this is the best legislation we can have. I'm just saying that we have a high level protection of copyright and the protection is based even in the digital environment on the property rule. Property rule entails an authorization system, a licensing system. We should boost this kind of licensing systems. The, my point was more about the critique that has been made according to which, oh, not in all sectors we would benefit from this because we don't have the technologies. But at the same time, you have to give the sectors a boost somehow. Okay, now I see we have a question over here. And the best of you, get your thinking caps on. I will have come to the floor after this. Uh, a little bit comment and a question, actually. First of all, these provisions there. I, I'm, my name is Burak Özgen. I represent JSAC, which is the organization representing the author societies in Europe. Uh, and the authors actually at the forefront in defending and actually asking for this kind of provisions on this issue of transfer of value value gap. And it's indeed a big, big issue for creators across Europe and actually worldwide that you can see also in the other parts of the world now they are raising this. If you don't like the word value gap, you can use the transfer of value. It's the same thing. It's not only about how the difference how much Spotify pays versus how much you to pay, but it's about the entire devaluation of the market that you cannot set anymore the real value of the content on internet because the biggest players in the market are not paying anything, refusing or paying under value. So that what needs to be fixed because we cannot get the best value also from the other services due to this problem. Uh, another thing regarding the human rights aspect and the uh, filtering obligations, I think there is, a, to my mind, a mistake when referring to the netlock case all the time as a basis of uh, arguing that these proposals are against the fundamental rights. I would use the net law case as an argument to support these provisions because what the court said there were two things. The technology that was asked in that case 10 years ago was requiring uh, completely different things than what is required in this proposal. And the court said, if the technology that you are using is getting information on the personal profiles of the net lock users, then you are infringing the data protection and the privacy. With these technologies for the transfer of value, you don't need to know who is uploading the content. You only need to know which content that is provided by the right holders used how many times, maybe in which country, that's all. The other thing the court was saying that if a service is required to look the entire content on the platform, and try to find facts about the copyright infringement status of those content, that would go a far, that would go very far, and then that would constitute a general obligation. But here, what the Commission asks and what we are after is a specific targeted approach to ask only the content provided by the right holders to be matched with the content that is uploaded by the users. It's only that metadata that is provided by the right holders. And the service does not have to find facts on the content because it will be provided by the right holders. And with the cooperation which does not exist today, most of the problems will be eliminated because the parties will agree on the standards and thresholds and certain provisions to eliminate most of the, uh, Ill most of the unnecessary removals. And in any case, there will be a redress mechanism. So I think the... Uh, I think analysis you are giving on the net lock case is misleading and not correct. Okay, I think we take that point and I will ask the panel in a moment, but first I'll get another couple of questions and we'll tackle them in rounds. Uh, Dimi, you had a question. Yes, hi, I'm Dimi from Wikimedia. Um, we steward a large website called Wikipedia. And I wanna start off by saying that um, I actually broadly agree with, um, well, uh, with that uh, rules need to be respected and they need to be enforced. And I broadly agree um, with the idea that um, the revenues need to be distributed and distributed as fairly as possible amongst everybody um, that is um, taking part in this. Um, what I struggle with is um, the, the fact that Article 13, as I read it now, and please correct me if, if I'm wrong, would um, 
ask us to install um, um, uh, content recognition technologies, and it would ask us to sign deals with rights holders. Even though, if you look at the top 100 websites in the world, um, we're the only top 100 website that is not for profit, and we're the top 100 website with the least amount of copyright infringements that you'll find. So my question is, if we already respect all these rules and um, we base all our content on, on, only on, on copyright exceptions, on free licenses, and on public domain works, why would we still be asked to install content recognition technologies that do not um, respect fair speech provisions and they do not, for the most part, recognize um, uh, exceptions and limitations? Thank you. Okay, and then a uh, very quick question here. Yeah. Sorry, yes, uh, I re want to react to the people that said, well, I'm not a technical guy. Well, I am a technical guy. Um, and um, there is no 95%, uh, well, sorry, I'm both a technical guy and someone who has lived in China for three years, where we have plenty of experience with content filtering. Um, there is no 95% filtering of what the users are doing. You are doing it or you're not. You're looking at everything, you're looking at whatever is being done to find what you're looking for, or you're just not doing it. That is your choice. The only thing you can do is have the tools and then have people decide, policemen, for example, on a case-by-case -case basis, we're going to use this tool for this case. This is what you do with law enforcement or police work. But the idea of having a benign filtering of what everybody is doing for the case, that they might do something. If I can, may remind everyone, we're not talking about criminal activities, hurting people, whatever. We're talking about copyright law infringement. And this is like, I don't know, smashing a fly with a full tank to me, but so that's, that's really something you might want to think about because this is really like a, a, an immense tool. I've seen things in China, honestly, you can censor everything you're doing in the moment you're doing it. You don't want to be the one introducing this to everyone, to every, because this is what we're talking about. Every platform in Europe should be doing this. Okay, um, and I will allow Max since you're an MEP. <coughs> Max Anderson, Swedish Green Party. Uh, as a Green, I'm quite familiar with the idea of legislating in order to demand development of new technologies. Uh, we Greens, we like that. But when you do that, you have to be certain that those technologies that you legislate a demand for will actually be there in reality when the law comes into force. If we had a law saying that every new car tomorrow has to be completely 100% free, emission free, then uh, I foresee a disaster. Things take time and we don't know if there is ever going to be a filtering technology that would be cheap enough and functional enough to be able to use. And if we, for instance, should create law that kills off Wikipedia, that kills off Kickstarter, that would be a very bad thing. Okay, um, we're gonna get some responses from the panels here on those last sort of three, four questions. So to summarize from GSAC, uh, is that Sabam Netlog case a bit outdated or off the point? From Wikimedia, if they're already obeying the rules, do we need new rules? And uh, raising the issue of uh, chilling effects of Chinese style filtering. Uh, so. I'll go left to right. Left, okay. Um, so I, I, I would like to react to that. If I am allowed to react uh, with a short remark and with a question, and if, uh, and if it, I can get an answer, maybe uh, that would be great. So uh, the answer is uh, your argument about netlog uh, is a very good argument. Um, then again, I, this is not shying away uh, from the question, but then again, uh, I am not a technical expert, so I'm not sure if the technology involves processing information about users or not. I think that as long as uh, processing or monitoring the works involves identifying, analyzing, 
data that is related to the user profile, I think an argument can be made. But, but I think that's a very good argument. But I would counter-argue with another fundamental right that we haven't discussed today, or at least uh, very lightly, which is the freedom to conduct the business. Um, I think that let's uh, work on the basis of the current state of technology. Content recognition technology is expensive, and it will be for the foreseeable future, I think. I think. Um, requiring online platforms to use such technologies, I think, entails erecting a market barrier that is very costly to overcome. This creates problems with freedom to conduct a business, which is protected by the Charter of Fundamental Rights, uh, as you know. This obligation to filter user uploads would certainly discourage investment in the development of this type of, of platforms. These platforms have been very important for something that all of us in this room like very much, which is user creativity. So discouraging the investment in these platforms would have indirect adverse effects on user participation, on user creativity. So uh, this is usually put together under the argument that the value gap proposal hinders digital innovation. How would you react to that? Briefly. <laughs> Thanks so much for asking that because I was a little bit afraid that I couldn't have the time to say that. So, a couple of arguments on that. First of all, I think it's again that we believe it's misleading that those technologies are a luxury in the content technology world of today. I think if you, to be a tech company, I think analyzing data, looking at it, how it works, and then use it for business is today, it's not a luxury. And we have already identified several companies, European, non-European, providing third-party solutions for the platforms for this kind of efficient technologies for content recognition. It could be another, con it could be another wording, but it's, that would be efficient for rights management, first of all, which does not have to be only for removal, because we really need it for the rights management and licensing. And they are for smaller companies for the volume of the services not expensive at all. It's also in the Commission's uh, impact assessment. I can send the name of the services as well. Apart from that, there are other legitimate businesses in Europe who are suffering from doing business vis-a-vis -vis this unfair competition coming from the big players who are not paying. Moreover, the creators and creative businesses are businesses in Europe as well, as pointed out by Maria Gabriel, providing the driving force for the EU economy. So it's their business freedom is also at stake right now. Okay. Short reaction. Taking into account that uh, the most developed content recognition technology has cost 60 million euros to develop, I would be a bit skeptical about the effectiveness of much cheaper technologies. But I'm not sure. I must admit that I am not sure, but I would be very skeptical about the number of false positives generated by those technologies. Okay, Axel, do you want to respond to one of those okay. three questions? And I will then come and take some more from the room. I've seen the hands up. And we're skipping this coffee break because you all misbehaved at the last one. <laughs> Um, so, if I'm uh, coming to, to your question, why content regulations or issues like these? Um, because the reality shows that someone is abusing the system in the end. So, we have infringements. There are some, even if a lot of people are respecting everything else, um, there are infringements. Um, otherwise, we can ask why we need a criminal law if everyone is respecting our um, regulations, what we have in place otherwise. So I, I think we, we um, have to deal with the reality that there are infringements and we should do something against it. Um, otherwise, we will give up something of our laws, what we have already in place, and I'm not sure if this is the... Um, intention at the end, uh, if we are entering a new uh, era of, of digitalization and then giving up everything what we have had in place, this is not um, what we should do and therefore we should try, at least probably we, we can't fulfill this 100% at the end, but we should um, uh, try to balance this a little bit better at the end if we are seeing this is taking place. 
Um, if we are coming to the censorship, so if you are considering um, platform providers already as a state-leaded um, situation and that they are all are censoring uh, the whole information world, I wouldn't go that far. Um, um, so, of course, we are, we are talking about filtering systems and this creates uh, awareness uh, in, in a different uh, situation. But I don't know if this might be possible in kind of a detection tool or whatever, when, whenever something sh pops up, um, if, if you have a special signature, so you don't need something. I don't know if this is possible, but uh, theoretically, I would say um, you don't have to go through to everything, it would be enough in um, if you're uploading something and this has a special signature and then this pops up. I, I don't know, this works for me differently, so that you are not aware of all this content and you're not censoring, you're just making sure that infringement, in, infringements will detect it. But uh, using the word censorship, I wouldn't go that far. This is a company who is using uh, copyright protected works for attracting people in uploading um, some content. And why can't we ask them in doing everything they can to avoid infringements of copyright protected works? I'm, I'm not sure why this shouldn't be possible at the end. Well, this creates another question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Already filtered, yeah. yeah. Okay, for the live stream, because people following online won't have heard what Gilles just said, which is that there's a difference between asking platforms to do their best and making it mandatory. Very brief responses, because we're already well over time. What else would you recommend, then, to avoid copyright infringements? Um, we, we are open for every other solutions. <laughs> okay, and you can do it bilaterally after this. So uh, quickly, I'm going to let our other two panelists very briefly if you respond to any of those three points. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'd like to respond to uh, the netlog uh, argument. Uh, netlog uh, comes after Skarit um, Sabam. Audible Magic was there at that time. Uh, it's expressly mentioned in, in, in the, the, the Belgium decision. So I don't think we are dealing now with something that was completely ignored at that time. Um, to go back to the data protection issue and the profiling issue, uh, well, if you look at Article 13, well, you will need to be dealing with personal data because you have to have complaints and redress mechanisms in place. So it's about potentially behind in profiling uh, individuals uh, in some ways. Um, and the systematic processing of personal, yeah, but that's the definition of personal data is very broad. You can't simply live in a, in a copyright bubble. I mean, if you look at the recent decisions in the field of data protection and the, the definition of profiling in the GDPR and uh, the implication of that, which means uh, some, some sort of requirements like data protection impact assessments and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, it's, if you want to give the right to the content producer to s express his view on what's happening, you will need to be dealing with personal data. Okay, well, let's not get into that right now. Okay, so be very quickly. Well, I don't see uh, why the uh, argument of user creativity should be uh, brought here. Um, I'm a bit uh, confused by this. Uh, I don't see a conflict between this kind of obligation that, in my view, already exists. If copyright law is taken seriously, this obligation already exists. Um, User creativity is, a, is, is something that uh, these platforms should actually boost, and it's actually something that the, these platforms are designed to, 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 you know, to, to foster. The problem is that no user reads carefully what the terms of service 
provide. So, um, have you ever read the terms of service of Facebook, Google, Instagram? You would not be entitled to post something you don't have the right to publish. So basically, this kind of filtering system, this kind of fil filtering obligation, already exists contractually and on the grounds of copyright, which is a property rule. You might like it or not. Um, then I have a very final uh, uh, remark uh, on this obsession for monitoring, monitoring censorship. Well, we already live in this kind of world. We are constantly monitored. Uh, when we use this platform, all what we do is already available to people that sell our data. We are profiles, we are the product. This is something that is already, uh, you know, I, I think digested as a notion. We have to live with that, and we have to decide whether or not the cost of monitoring should be uh, left to the creative sector or should be, you know, allocated in a different way. And which, uh, very final, sorry. The notice and take down mechanism would continue to exist. I'm not, I'm, we, this obligation should not be taken in my view as a sort of, you know, obligation for every platform to have the same technology. This is something that it's the opposite of what technology has become today. We have very nuanced technology, very precise, very sophisticated systems. I don't understand why Wikipedia, I, I discussed this uh, with Dimitri some months ago, I don't see okay. Wikip how Wikipedia should be uh, endangered by this obligation because this measure should be adequate and proportionate. Nobody has stressed the fact that this measure should be proportionate. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. I think you would find a lot of people who aren't prepared to live with being constantly monitored, but that's for a different panel on a different day. I'm going to uh, finish up by taking four quick comments around the room. I see the lady with the blonde hair, I see Sylvie, a uh, gentleman here with the glasses, and then Julia. I'm sorry the rest of you save your questions until we have some new panelists, so. Okay. I'm Christina Mercuriadi. I'm a parliamentary assistant of an MEP that followed this file for the Committee on Culture, and I think we managed to kind of find a way out of it because we said, clarified in the article, that no personal data should be retained of the user. That's not what we're, that what we're trying to do. We just rely on this digital fingerprint provided by the right holders. It is key to remunerate and to, um, and to actually avoid infringements, and more importantly, to remunerate. So we actually took because there was a point where you can't have normative statements in recitals. We actually included that these platforms should conduct licenses in the articles. And uh, I wanted to say that I find it a bit, a bit misleading how this has anything to do with personal data, censorship, and I don't see the link. Okay, well, as I say, for another day, Sylvie. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sylvie here, Sylvie Fodor from CEPIC. So CEPIC represents picture agencies and photographers. So I want to take to say something here because photography was mentioned a couple of times. I mean, first, uh, so it's half a question, half a comment. I mean, first, yeah, it's true that words have a meaning and it's uh, the words you use uh, are very important. So maybe the, the word value gap is not the right one. In, for, in fact, it doesn't cover the situation of photography where it's really a value block from the photographs which are shared online. They're just very often zero, zero coming back from the platform back to the author. That's why we prefer the, the, the term transfer of value, so that may be uh, in terms of uh, understanding. Uh, why transfer of value? Because you need to understand that uh, these platforms use an, another, they have an, a business model which is based on advertising. They need the, the user's data of these people visiting their website, and that's where they make their money. And from this money made on advertising, there's nothing ba going back to the, to the, to the, to the, to the right holders, to the foot in our case to the photographers. Now, regarding the uh, same thing with fil filtering, I really wonder why we've been using the word filtering all along this panel, because in the directive, the, the, the wording used is content rec recognition technology. As far as uh, photography is a concern, a content recognition technology exists. It's very good. It's with a fiability, um, fiability uh, reliability, reliability of 99%. And it's used by the rights holders at the moment. It's not the platforms. That's why uh, you may think that they are not uh, using it because Facebook uh, or uh, YouTube has developed a content ID for, uh, for videos or for music 
uh, photography is outside, and uh, but they they have uh, the photographers themselves use this content recognition te technology. Now, if a photographer is with an uh, earning an average twenty five thousand euros a year can implement that technology, we think that platforms can do it as well. Okay, gentleman over here. Okay, now it works. Okay. Um, Martin Husovec, Tilburg University. Oh, sorry. Was... Okay, well, okay we have two gentlemen in glasses. Okay, okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. John Phelan from IFPI. Uh, just to come back to the fundamental question of the, uh, of the numbers behind the value gap, we're just one of the sectors, as the recorded music sector, behind, of the creative industries which are affected uh, by this lack of clarity currently in the law. And it was pointed out that the last year there was 5.6% growth in the recorded music sector. That is indeed correct. But that has to be borne in mind that that has been a 40% loss to the recorded music sector over a decade. That would decimate most industries. And actually the growth of the 5.6% has been primarily driven by the move of our industry towards digital service providers by putting the music catalogs onto digital licensed services. The actual decimation of 40% is not coincidental to the emergence of UUC platforms of which there are 1.3 billion users of YouTube versus the 65 million users of licensed services. So that compounds the fact that a UUC service per user per year pays 18 times less than a licensed service. Those are the metrics, and it's very, very simple, and it's not coincidental okay. with the lack of clarity. Just Thank you. Point, point taken. Uh, Julia, and then Sophie, final word for this panel. Yes, uh, a question rather than a statement. We've discussed a lot about the direct impact of filters on fundamental rights. I want to ask about the indirect impact. Um, there has been a li list of legal questions from six member states to the Council Legal Service where they point out that copyright exceptions are the embodiment of fundamental rights other than intellectual property in copyright law. So, for example, parody uh, or uh, quotation protect uh, the freedom of expression or the freedom of the sciences. So the question is, since I'm not aware of any technologies, any filtering technologies that can automatically detect whether an exception applies or not, especially in the fragmented landscape, do you think it is appropriate uh, for the protection of fundamental rights if copyright exceptions can only be respected after the fact through a redress mechanism, or do we have to ensure somehow that people can rely on these exceptions when they upload legal content to a platform that they can be sure that it stays online, or at least have a reasonable certainty that it stays online? I'm going to let that hang there in the air for people to think about rather than ask for answers, because we're already way over time, so if I said you could have a final word. Yeah, I just want to clarify uh, the notion of personal data. Personal data can be uh, personal data by content, but also by purpose and by result. So it's very key, actually, to go back also to that field and not, and not think into silos. Okay, I'm sorry if we've got to cut it. Well, not short, but we're already cutting into the next panel, and there are great speakers sitting down there waiting patiently. But do join me in thanking our panel number two. Thank you. Thank you.